Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon. The Financial Times reports the Ukraine war will define EU-China relations. They say Xi Jinping's support for Moscow brings home what it means for Beijing to be a systemic rival. You know, France's President Macron, he goes to China, he meets with President Xi, and a major international paper writes, as the as the Financial Times, Beijing's no limits partnership with Moscow during Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has hammered home to many Europeans that it means for China to become a systemic rival. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He holds a he holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History at the uh, and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow, and the Roots of American Fascism. Uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I had a real problem with this Financial Times article because it seems to be a, well, the, the way it frames the narrative, it continues to fan the anti-China flames and rhetoric and it really takes what's happening, I believe, out of its accurate context. Your thought, Dr. Gerald Horn? Well, clearly the European Union, particularly France, are kind of stuck with regard to the People's Republic of China. You see this in this charade that they're now uh, performing in Beijing, where President Macron is materializing as the so-called good cop. Uh, talking about he wants to talk sense to President Xi with regard to breaking with Russia. Of course, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that what Mr. President Macron is saying is that China break with Russia so we can come after you next. And obviously, China is not going to fall for that trick. Uh, whereas uh, Ursula von der Leyen, who was alongside Mr. Macron, is playing the bad cop. Recall the speech she gave a few days ago, uh, which was billed as a major formulation of policy of Brussels towards China, where she said that the European Union should move to de-risk with regard to their problems and issues with China, as opposed to decoupling, mm -hmm. which is the mantra coming out of Washington right now. Now, fundamentally, I really don't see that much of a difference uh, in the objective sense between de-risking and decoupling. Uh, that is to say, uh, you can only suggest that Washington would probably move closer to hot war than Brussels. But since Brussels tends to be a lapdog of Washington, it would not be far behind if that disaster uh, were to unfold. And I think that objective observers recognize that the issue is not decouple or de-risk, it's de-problem, which is imperialism, which is now in a crisis because of the rise of China and its relationship with Moscow, uh, which portends a significant profound shift in the global correlation of forces foreshadowing a new world order foreshadowing de-dollarization with consequences that both Washington and Brussels uh, find too ghastly to contemplate. We should also not take seriously uh, some of this rhetoric coming out of Brussels, even if it's repeated in China, because keep in mind that alongside Mr. Macron is a plane load of business executives who are thirsting to cut deals with Beijing, and I'm sure the Chinese will throw them a few baubles to satiate their appetites. But that really exposes the nature of the game, just as when Chancellor Schultz traveled to Beijing a few months ago, he too was accompanied by a plane load of businessmen. And I think it's well past time for the European leaders to recognize that they made a fundamental error when they tailed after Washington during the Cold War, which fundamentally involved an entente with the People's Republic of China that led to massive foreign direct investment 
in China, which has now created a juggernaut that they have no answer for. In fact, it's quite astonishing in retrospect how often these European nations tail after Washington when it obviously cuts against their own interests. I mean, keep in mind that before the consolidation of Germany in 1991, one has to ask, uh, during that period, what did France gain from the consolidation of Germany? What did Britain gain? Uh, that is to say, a stronger Germany, uh, if you look at the 20th century, was the bane of existence of both London and Paris, but yet they acquiesced to the liquidation of socialist East Germany. And I'm not sure if that was in their material interest, but of course, uh, these folks are not necessarily the keenest students of history. Uh, speaking of which, uh, Mr. Macron oftentimes talks about the strategic autonomy uh, of Europe and the European Union. And he's mentioned in, in the past that NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is approaching brain death. And yet, he does not break decisively with the more boneheaded policies of NATO, including this proxy war in Ukraine, which allows me to mention that, once again, it's difficult to take Ursula von der Leyen seriously. She's the German person who now is head of the European Commission and is accompanying Mr. Macron, as Afra mentioned, because she's auditioning to be the next head of NATO. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now, that's why her remarks are so hawkish. But uh, I'm afraid to inform Ursula von der Leyen that the way uh, NATO is encountering uh, a major stumbling block in Ukraine, uh, she may be joining an organization that's headed for the dustbin of history. I'm going to try to combine a couple of things here. You've got you've got Schultz going to talk to President Xi. You've got Macron going to talk to Xi. You've got von der Leyen going to talk to him on behalf of the EU. So that lithium, Zimbabwe, China, and Vice President Harris's latest trip to Africa where she's championing democracy. But as Zimbabwe wants to sell their lithium to China, the United States isn't happy about that. Well, this also illustrates the horn of a dilemma in which the Europeans find themselves part in the apparent self-reference. What I mean is that once again, you saw that nations like France tailed after Washington and London when they slapped sanctions on Zimbabwe, which fought a bitter war of liberation culminating in 1980 with independence mm -hmm. against a minority regime, minority so-called white regime uh, in Zimbabwe. And then years later, the ruling party moved to reverse the fruits of settler colonialism by seizing land from the invading Europeans, many of whom had only come post-1945. Washington and London reacted badly. They tried to strangle uh, Zimbabwe. Wait a minute. It, because they initially agreed to allow for land uh, reclamation. In Britain, in the Balfour House Agreement, not Balfour, it was... Um, Lancaster House. Lancaster, thank you. Lancaster House Agreement, Britain agreed to pay the white Zimbabweans, or at the time, for their land. And the United States backed the deal. And then when Britain withdrew, Ronald Reagan, he withdrew as well. So I just want to make the point that that um, Robert Mugabe had originally agreed uh, that, that Britain had originally agreed with Mugabe to pay those settlers for their land. Then, of course, the predictable happened. Uh, they reneged the on right their commitment. Oh, in the face of pressure from white right wing lobbies in both Washington and Britain leading to an attempt to strangle the Zimbabwean economy, uh, which put so much pressure on the ruling party that there was an eternal coup a few years ago that led to the ouster of Mr. Mugabe. But that led to the predictable, which was Zimbabwe moving closer to China, which had supported uh, the ruling party during the time it was fighting for liberation. And now, lo and behold, the North Atlantic nations uh, ascertained that Zimbabwe is a major global source for lithium, uh, 
which is essential to the green economy that will emerge during the 21st century if we will have any chance of avoiding uh, global heating and climate change. And so now <laughs> you see certain European nations who had tailed after Washington with regard to struggling in Zimbabwe, now they want to do a 180-degree reversal. But the, the point is that they should have maintained positive relations with Harare, with the ruling party in Harare, Zimbabwe, instead of tailing after Washington, which, as I said, the same kind of policy uh, they have had followed during the Cold War uh, with regard to, for example, the liquidation of socialist East Germany. Now, fortunately, uh, we can hope that they're not going to tail after Washington with regard to a new Cold War against China. That's the import of what Mr. Macron is doing in China as we speak. At the same time, you see Speaker McCarthy of the U.S. House of Representatives a meeting with the so-called president of Taiwan, the rebel island off the coast of China, that purports to be semi-independent, if not wholly independent, and in which Washington is building into an unsinkable aircraft carrier from which China can be challenged, apparently the Europeans, or at least the French, do not plan to go along with that harebrained scheme. And I trust and I hope that that is an accurate assessment of the events. When you look at the optics of those that are making their way to China to talk to President Xi and the resulting agreement, such as the, the broker deal between the Saudis and the Iranians and now what we see happening with Turkey and Syria and Oman. I mean, there's a whole there are a whole lot of things that are coming to fruition here, the end, possibly the end of the war in Yemen. The optics of this really seems as though the world sees Xi as the real deal maker and Joe Biden is left standing in the parking lot. We, we got 30 seconds. Well, it's not only that, but Washington, U.S. imperialism obviously has this proclivity for starting brush fires, starting wars. The world would prefer another course, which is now embodied by Beijing and President Xi, which is trying to settle wars, settle brush fires and move on to peaceful development, which is what humanity longs for and yearns for. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that analysis. We look forward to having you back. 